Hello everybody. Welcome to the second part of our facial nerve class. So in our pre previous session, we learned about the nuclei, cores and the branches and supply. We discussed both the intracranial and extracranial cores of the facial nerve. If you have any doubt, please check out my previous video on the same topic. This is part 2 of the series on facial nerve and in this video, we will be seeing the facial nerve lesions and how to localize them based on your clinical presentation. A bit about functional components and the clinical correlations. So let's move on to the video. Why do we need an intact facial nerve? As you would all know or have probably read by now, the facial nerve is important as it innervates all the muscles of facial expression as well as it carries fibers of taste and salivation. It also innervates other glands such as your tear gland and certain mucous glands of your nasal pharynx and the nasal area. So all these are what the facial nerve does and that is why it is really important. If you lose the facial nerve, these areas are all affected. And lesions of the facial nerve can be classified into two types, mainly supranuclear lesion and an intranuclear lesion. So supranuclear basically means above the level of the nucleus. So from our previous video where we discussed the nuclei of the facial nerve, we know that the facial nerve nuclei are located at the level of the pontomedullary junction. There are three sets of nuclei, parasympathetic, primary motor or branchiomotor and the nucleus tractus solitarius which it shares with the glossopharyngeal as well as the vagus and it carries taste sensations. So supranuclear, all these nuclei receive their innervation from higher centers namely the cortex. So cortical centers, face areas of the cortical center both in the frontal and the parietal lobe provide fibers to the facial nerve and these fibers when affected result in a supranuclear lesion. So as you can see in this picture let us place a supranuclear lesion on this side and you can see the fibers are coming down to the pontine region and from there it is going to the face. In the case of a supranuclear region, a lesion what happens is we get a paralysis of the opposite side of the face. Students would do good to remember that the brain always innervates the opposite side. So whenever you have a higher center lesion, it's always the opposite side which is affected. This is not true of lower lesions which we will see later. So in a supranuclear lesion, we have a paralysis of the opposite side. Thus, thus but the brain has actually made provisions for itself in case of any problems. So we have something called bilateral representation. What this means is that it shares some of its fibers to some areas with the opposite side of the brain. So when we have a lesion on one side, the opposite side compensates. And so because of this, in a supranuclear lesion, we have very little involvement of the forehead as can be seen in this patient's face. The forehead muscles are not involved. Paralysis only occurs in the lower half of the face. Also, not affected are your stepedial reflex. You have a normal hearing. There is no hyperacusis. There is no loss of taste and there is no loss of salivation. So these are all bilaterally represented by the opposite and taken over. The function is taken over by the healthy side of the brain. When it comes to an infranuclear lesion, what is meant by infranuclear is all the fibers which are starting off from the nucleus and beyond the nucleus. So in the case of the facial nerve, as you all know, the nucleus is located in the pontomedullary junction or rather the nuclei are located in the pontomedullary junction and beyond that all the fibers, meaning the actual facial nerve whenever or if ever it is injured or affected in any area beyond the origin from the nuclei, it is called an infranuclear lesion. In this case, there is no scope as uh, in the picture, there is an infranuclear site which is involved in the picture. And in this case, there is no hope. The entire face on the same side of the lesion is affected because the crossing of the fibers have already entered the facial nerve. And depending on the degree or the level of the lesion, we, the patient, not us, <laughs> the patient may lose taste, may have hyperacusis, may or may not have hyperacusis, may or may not lose taste, may or may not lose, may or may not lose tear production and salivation. But that depends on the degree or the level of the lesion, which is what we'll be seeing in the coming slides. So the basic example or the main example of a supranuclear lesion, also called a UMN lesion, is the stroke. And the most common cause of an LMN or an infranuclear lesion is the Bell's palsy. Well, let's see whether we can guess the level of the lesion depending on our clinical presentation. 
let's imagine a patient coming to us with the set of with a facial nerve palsy we have to guess where the lesion has occurred so let's see this this is a schematic diagram of the course of the facial nerve the same diagram is given in different capacities in different texts of yours but basically let's label the parts the facial nerve starts as nuclei from the pons, it goes forward and it bends. The first genu is at the geniculate ganglion. At the geniculate ganglion, the nerve given off is the greater petrosal nerve. The facial nerve then continues along the medial wall, goes to the posterior wall where it first gives off the nerve to the stapedius and then continues further down and gives off the chorda tympani. After that, it exits via the stylomastoid foramen and becomes terminal branches which supply the muscles of the face. Now, let's take patient number one. He has presented with a dry eye. A dry eye means there is lack of tear production and we know that the nerve concerned with tear production is the greater petrosal nerve. So, the greater petrosal nerve is affected in this patient. Let's cancel out that nerve from the picture. Okay, so that nerve does not receive any fibers. There is a lesion before that. Okay. The patient also has hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is when there is no stapedial reflex and the patient perceives loud sounds excruciatingly or painfully. And this is because of affecting the nerve to stapedius. So there are no fibers going beyond that region also. Let's cancel out that region. The third symptom or presentation is loss of taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and as well as reduced salivation. Note this point, it is reduced salivation. This is because the facial nerve only supplies two of three salivary glands. The parotid gland is still intact because there is no glossopharyngeal nerve lesion here. We are only talking about the facial nerve lesion. So, even though the submandibular and salivary and sublingual are affected, there is a slight reduction in salivation only. There is no complete loss of salivation because the glossopharyngeal and the parotid gland will compensate. So, that is the third lesion. We have loss of cauda tympani. Now, let us cancel out those fibers. Yes, the even the tongue and the cauda tympani have disappeared. And lastly, the patient has paralysis of muscles of facial expression. So, the terminal branches are also affected and this is the picture. So, all the branches from the picture, it is very clear, all the branches below the level of the geniculate ganglion are gone, which means the lesion is either at the level of geniculate ganglion or even before the geniculate ganglion, probably in the internal acoustic meatus. So, that is the first lesion that you will be seeing, internal acoustic meatus or geniculate ganglion. Now, let us see the second case, patient number 2. Here, he has an intact greater petrosal nerve as evidenced by a normal tear production, but he has hyperacusis, so no stapedial reflex, nerve to stapes, loss of taste, reduced salivation, so no cauda tympani, let us cancel that, yes. And of course, we have paralysis of muscles of facial expression, so the terminal branches are also gone. Now, we can guess since the greater petrosal nerve is more or less intact, the lesion has is beyond the origin of that nerve, probably beyond the greater petrosal, the geniculate ganglion, but the nerve to stapedius is lost. So, the lesion is before the nerve to stapedius. So, the site of lesion will be in the facial canal above the nerve to stapedius. That is lesion number 2. Let us move on to lesion number 3 and I think by now you would have got an idea of how this is progressing. Let us see whether you can guess this. Tear production is present. So, which is the nerve which is intact? It is the greater petrosal nerve. We have a normal stapedial reflex. There is no hyperacusis for patient number 3. So, nerve to stapedius is intact. Here we also have, we have loss of taste which means the cauda tympani is gone. Let us cut that nerve. There is also paralysis of muscles of facial expression. So, the terminal branches are also gone. Obviously, till the nerve to stapedius, the facial nerve is intact. The lesion is just after the nerve to stapedius. But since the cauda tympani is gone, the level of the lesion is just above the cauda tympani. You are right. And the lesion is at the facial canal. But below the nerve to stapedius, above the cauda tympani. Yes. Okay. Now, for the last case, normal tear production. Greater petrosal nerve is not affected. No hyperacusis, nerve to stapedius is not affected. Taste and salivation are perfectly normal. The cauda tympani is intact. Here, he only has paralysis of facial muscles. So, obviously, we have terminal branches gone. 
and the lesion is below the level of the cauda tympani either just above the stylomastoid foramen or just below the stylomastoid foramen. So those are the basic levels of lesion. I hope this benefits you. It's just an undergraduate level of teaching this level. So let's see. Continuing. What are functional components? So there is a lot of confusion, confusion among undergraduate students regarding functional components. So what are they? So basically what it means is functional component of a cranial nerve is the sum total of all the fibers of different functions that it carries. Some cranial nerves are motor and some cranial nerves are sensory and you also have mixed cranial nerves. So functional component of a mixed cranial nerve is explained better by labeling each of those different functions using three alphabets. So let's see what they are. The efferent, the motor uh, functional component is also called an efferent or an E component. There are three types of E component or efferent components. So some facial nerves, some nerves, not facial nerves, some cranial nerves supply muscles from somites, origin taking origin from somites, namely the muscles of the eye and the tongue. And such cranial nerves are said to have an SE component, also called somatic efferent. Somatic meaning coming from somites and efferent meaning motor. So such cranial nerves are usually the third cranial nerve, the fourth and the sixth as well as the twelfth cranial nerve. The twelfth is hypoglossal, it supplies the tongue muscles. Three, four and six supply the eye muscles. The other two components of the efferent subdivision are the special visceral efferent. It supplies, it provides motor fibers. Efferent means motor motor fibers to special viscera, meaning viscera or structures taking origin from branchial arches. So this component is also called branchiomotor. The last one is general visceral different. This supplies parasympathetic, meaning it is motor to smooth muscles of the viscera, blood vessels and glands. So it is parasympathetic and that is the general visceral different component. <coughs> Sorry. What about the afferent components? The afferent components are mainly four. These are not, this is just a general example of what are the different functional components. We will see how many of these are present in the facial nerve later. So let's go on. Sensory or afferent components are four. There is general visceral afferent which carries all sensations from viscera. Viscera include your trachea, your esophagus, your abdominal viscera your pharynx, all of these viscera and all the general sensations such as pain and touch, all of them from viscera come under GVA components. So any cranial nerve which supplies the sensations to these areas will have a GVA set of components. I hope you get the idea. The next sensory component is the special visceral afferent. So a viscera with a special sensory uh, component is the tongue. It is a viscera with a special sensory component and the special component is taste. So cranial nerves which supply taste possess the SVA or special visceral afferent component. So taste is carried by like we mentioned before the nucleus tractus solitarius and so this is carried by the 7th, the 9th and the 10th cranial nerve and all of these have an SVA component. The next one, the third one is general somatic afferent so general sensations afferent means sensations general sensations from skin and muscles these are coming from the somites so skin and muscles muscles are proprioceptive skin sensations are classified as extraceptive so these are carried by gsa component and the most common example that we can find is your trigeminal nerve the last is a special somatic afferent and this component is only and only seen in the eighth cranial nerve which is the vestibulocochlear. So you will not get a special SA or SSA component in any other cranial nerve. You need to write SSA only in the case of a vestibulocochlear nerve. Now let's see how many of these, how many of these are present in the facial nerve. Now we know that the facial nerve is a nerve of the second branchial arch so obviously it supplies the muscles of the second branchial arch and therefore it has an SVE or special visceral efferent component which is branchiomotor. Uh, pharyngeal arches are also called branchial arches. The next motor component that the facial nerve has is a parasympathetic component because it supplies fibers to the smooth muscles of your tear gland via the greater petrosal. 
and the salivary gland via the cauda tympani. So it also has a GVE component called the parasympathetic component. Coming to the sensory components, obviously cauda tympani again, special visceral afferent which is coming towards inside is a sensory thing and that is taste and then you have a slight component which is actually a twig it receives from the spinal nucleus and tract of the trigeminal nerve which supplies the skin of the ear. So that is a GSA or general somatic afferent, skin of the ear, extraceptive sensations. So these are the functional components and with that we come to the end of the second video of the facial nerve. I hope you like the class and stay tuned for more anatomy classes. Thank you.